are you are you still doing your general physical therapy or you're like solely focused on you know foot re rehabilitation and, and just getting the foot back to it um yeah so i still practice in clinic um it's not a huge amount of hours i'm in clinic uh monday to thursday 10 to 2 so i see patients of general population athletes kind of you know whoever books in with me um i'm co-owner of a physio clinic in ottawa so i uh I'm still here. I run, you know, we just expanded the clinic from with a little bit more space and we put a foot collective, uh, the first, our first store um, is in the front area of the expansion. So I can kind of <clears throat> do both in one spot, which is kind of nice. Um, but more and more of my time is kind of, you know, getting asked for by the foot collective. Um, and so probably my clinical practice will taper down a little bit more, but I never want to stop treating and, and uh, working with people because I think that's, that's the best way to see whether what you're actually preaching works or not. So, um, so yeah, I still treat and I always kind of want to treat a certain amount of time, but I'll probably end up not specializing, but, um, focusing more on, um, kind of the foot and foot health. And I mean, really when you look at feet, it's more of a hip conversation anyway. So you end up treating the whole lower body if you're trying to treat someone's feet. But I think for the most part, if you, uh, develop a reputation as being someone that has a, a keen interest in a certain area of the body, um, those are the kind of people that, you know, it attracts a certain kind of people that want that part of their body treated. So by default, I end up treating a lot of foot issues. So it sounds like a really niche thing because I haven't heard, I mean, you're, you're pretty much the main person. I, I saw your account on Instagram yeah. and what foot collective. And then I went through your, through <laughs> your feed and, uh, at that time too, I was, I was just thinking, okay, do I need to switch from shoes to flat shoes? Like I was just in this point in my life where I was examining every part of my body and I realized mm -hmm. that like the feet don't really get talked about, uh, yeah. by default, it's like, Hey, we got to buy these shoes with these orthotics. Yeah. And, uh, I know I saw it as a, like a very big area of untapped potential where, um, you know, everyone, a lot of people that have dysfunctional feet don't actually have pain in their feet, which is, I think, why it's so pervasive. You know, the average person that I see in the clinic, if they come in and see me for their wrist, I'm going to look at their feet. I always assess people barefoot and get them moving barefoot. And almost every foot you look at is completely dysfunctional, whether or not they have pain or not in their feet. And, you know, the foot really gives you a glimpse as to what's happening at the hips. And I think you're probably aware and, and you know, everyone seems to be aware, but no one seems to be cluing in to the fact that we have to do something about it, but we all overdose on sitting, you know, the spending a lot of time with the hip at 90 degrees steals away your ability to use your very important hip muscles. Um, and you know, a lot of times that materializes as low back pain or knee pain or flat feet, but it's all a hip problem. And I think that's, you know, if you came, if you come to one of our seminars, most of the time, uh, is actually spent on hip stability, restoring hip mobility. We spend a little bit of time on the foot, but it's really, you know, correcting your feet is easy. Just don't wear shitty shoes and work on your feet a little bit every day and your feet go back to working like they're supposed to um, when we talk about the foot in isolation. But the hips are really the harder one to correct because almost everyone uh, stiffens up their hips every day by sitting in a chair. So it's, um, yeah, I saw it as a, you know, the deeper I went down the rabbit hole, the more I realized how truly lacking we are in an awareness of foot, the importance of the feet in terms of their mechanics um, and how to treat feet. You know, it seems like everyone in the world of treating foot dysfunction is kind of doing it in a very weird way where they're isolating the foot and not really paid to, paying attention to the fact that the foot can change, right? If you have a weak foot or stiff foot or painful foot, it can change. And we should probably work on it like we would work on any other body part instead of just putting it in these crazy supportive rigid shoes that squish our feet or orthotics that also stiffen up the foot quite a bit. So, um, yeah, it's been, it's been fun so far. And I, I, I always tell people, I don't claim to know everything about feet. I just really like learn about them and the way that I, you know, the, the information that we preach might change over time. And it, I, I would assume it would as we learn new information, but the way we see it right now, um, we need to really rethink how we think of footwear and, and treating foot problems. So. so what started you down the rabbit hole in the first place? I mean, was it a sp particular incident? Or was it, like, how did this happen? <laughs> yeah, so uh, I went to a conference about probably two years ago. I think it was in 2015, actually. So about three years ago. Um, 
and there was a speaker there. He was, his name's Donnie Thompson. He was a big power lifter from the Southern United States. And he talked about the ankle in a way that I had never heard anyone talk about the ankle before. And he really, something clicked with me to the fact that we're so many people have problems with their ankle. And if you think of the ankle and the foot, like the foundation of your body, if there's a problem there, everything upstream is going to be a problem as well. Um, you know, Greg Cook says it pretty well. He says, until you have 35 degrees of dorsiflexion, it's your biggest problem until you deal with it. And so, I think that kind of clued me into that, uh, to just thinking more about feet or thinking differently about feet. Um, and I quickly realized that what I learned in physio school when it came to feet and ankles was basically useless. We really weren't taught anything about, you know, uh, the fact that it's dysfunctional and problematic in a lot of people, um, let alone how to actually help people restore their feet and, and, you know, proper footwear and all that kind of stuff. So I had to kind of learn from scratch and I learned by working on myself because my feet and ankles were very stiff, very weak, very tight. Um, I was using lifting shoes to squat with. And so I just used myself as patient zero to test out different ways of working on the feet and restoring things. And I had really, really good results. So I started working on the same kind of stuff with patients and they started progressing very, very quick and improving, you know, people that come see me with plantar fasciitis for two years, get out of pain in two weeks. Um, not to say that the work is done, but you know, it was just crazy stuff that I was shocked. And it was a recurring pattern that these people would improve with extremely simple advice. So I just started, you know, getting into it and, and kind of thinking, okay, how, how can I, how can I reach more people? And that the Instagram account was really how it first started. And it was an exercise in forcing myself to try and learn and post, um, and word things in a way that people can understand it. And I think, the Instagram profile gaining in popularity really shows you that people are hungry for information about learning about their bodies, right? I don't tell people what to do. I just tell them kind of, I educate them about their bodies so that they can make good decisions. And, and I think that's, that's what we need to do as health professionals. We have to look at, okay, what is, if, you know, the solution to foot problems, I think, is education. And if you're going to have a solution, I think you better know, you know, the truth is very important when you're coming up with a solution to a problem. And the truth is modern footwear is destroying our feet. We're not treating foot dysfunction like we should. Um, and so that's kind of the base premise of what started the Foot Collective. And it just kind of blossomed into a couple other avenues, you know, the product side with the footwear, the balance side with the balance beams and all that kind of stuff. And our seminars really are are going to be our core product for the next um, at least couple of years and just trying to, you know, reach as many people around the world with and and, tra and then eventually train people to give these seminars because I think the information has to get out there um, and our, our motivation really isn't financial. Um, it's more just, you know, how are people not seeing this stuff, including people that are in the world of foot health, right? Podiatrists, foot doctors. Um, it really is frustrating when you hear someone come in and they've been told to wear crazy supportive shoes all day every day even in the shower and i've heard that before so um what? and it's oh, like yeah. yeah it's it's crazy there's some crazy shit out there and it's, it's very much um frustrating you know you see these pro athletes that have million dollar multi-million dollar contracts and they're having these non-contact injuries at their ankles and it's like those people aren't cluing in on it either and i think we just with the word has to get out there and if it means posting the odd shocking thing on instagram or you know really pushing forward with trying to get you know, the knowledge out there, then, um, you know, it's been a fun ride so far and looking forward to continuing with it. And that's got to be wild, though, that, that, you know, you get your you're sharing this message that shoes are fucking up our feet. I mean, do you yeah. get a lot of runners that come to you? Like, what? Oh, running like, running is the saddest like, thing. Running the saddest? Yeah. Saddest thing because people love to run. Okay. I think there's certain innate behaviors or things that we do as humans that have this natural reward cycle, right? Um, when you eat sugary foods, you, there's, there's chemicals in your brain that go off. When you have sex, when you run, you know, the runner's high, these are real things. And it's basically your body communicating to you with neurotransmitters saying you're doing what you're supposed to do. So people love to run, running feels good to do it. It puts people in a state of flow. For a lot of people, it's a stress reliever. And modern shoes are fucking up our running techniques so bad that people are literally destroying their knee joints and have to stop running because no one's cluing into the fact that instead of just saying, you know, a lot of doctors are saying, okay, it hurts to run, don't run. Instead of saying, maybe we should look at how you're actually running, right? And how silly, you know, compare that to someone that comes in, they come in and say, every time I deadlift, my back gets destroyed. And, you know, instead of saying, oh, well, maybe you shouldn't deadlift, maybe say, well, how much are you deadlifting? Are you deadlifting three plates without ever deadlifting before? Uh, are you deadlifting like shit with your back really bent? Like maybe we should work on how you're deadlifting. And the way this comes back to running is that 
modern shoes with cushioned heels promote a heel strike running pattern, which never happens if you're barefoot. It's it's an unnatural pattern for humans to run like that. And the only reason it's allowed, you know, started in 1972 when Bill Borman and, and uh, Phil Knight from Nike came out with the first heel cushion running shoe. And since then, it's just been this destruction of runners' bodies by allowing them to run with poor technique. And it's, you know, why do 70% of runners get hurt every year? You know, I, Irene Davis is a very smart lady. Um, you know, and I always tell people openly, like all the information I preach is not, I learned it from people way smarter than me. I'm just trying to digest it and deliver it to people in ways that they can understand it. Um, but she had a really good line in, in a talk I saw her do. It said, you don't see birds getting wing injuries from flying or fish getting fin injuries from swimming because they're designed to do that. Human beings are literally designed to run. So why are we all getting fucked up doing something we're supposed to be designed to do? And I think it's because we're running wrong. And at the end of the day, how you run is the biggest, is the most important factor, but the shoes you wear play a big role in how you run. And that that's right out of the words, right out of the mouth of Daniel Lieberman, who's a Harvard anthropologist and really smart guy when it comes to running mechanics. And, and I really think that's so true and so sad that so many people see running as this beautiful way to move and, and get active and exercise. And it seems like, you know, a combination of tight hips and poor footwear is, is, is basically creating running as a way for people to fast track themselves to injury, which kind of sucks. So that that's pretty insane. And the, when you say heel heel, so basically the shoes causing them to go heel toe, heel toe. Mm -hmm. The shoe is not, I wouldn't say it's causing them, it allows them to do that. So if you run barefoot, you're never ever going to let your heel hit the ground first uh, because it hurts a lot. <laughs> your heel is just a bone with a layer of kind of thin layer of fat pad on it, uh, which is designed to absorb the impacts of a heel strike with walking. Uh, but the reason we have this real thick, robust Achilles tendon is it's supposed to act like a giant elastic that absorbs energy when you land, stores it, and re-releases it to the next step. But that energy storage is actually what shelters all your other joints upstream from being smashed around every step and when you heel strike you negate all of that um, energy storage and and sheltering those joints upstream and so it doesn't hurt your heel anymore because you got a big slab of you know air under your heel um, but you land much harder and it's significantly harder on your joints upstream and that's typically how it, you know the problem materializes eventually is my knees kill me or my back hurts so I can't run anymore so. You know, I, I had stumbled upon this video on YouTube where this guy was dressed in medieval gear and he was trying mm -hmm. to demonstrate back then <laughs> I've seen that. how people were walking. And then he was doing the, it was a very exaggerated movement of, it was toe to heel. Mm -hmm. And it looked silly, but it made a lot of sense that, you know, they didn't have the shoes that they have right now. And I tried yeah. it out. I tried it out for about two weeks. Uh, it felt really awkward. But I could feel different muscles activating towards, uh, like, towards my upper legs and, and hips, actually. Well, with so walking, I, I think it's funny. I saw the exact same video, and someone sent me a message on Instagram and said, "Why would you change your mechanics from walking to running if one if, if there's a specific way that's most beneficial?" Um, and when I started looking into it more um, and listening to some really smart people talk about it, um, I realized that walking and running are very different. Right, the, the impact loading and the pattern, the gait pattern with walking versus running, very different. So I tried that toe striking thing with walking too. It felt so silly, but I was like, ah, I may as well try it. And uh, it turns out that we're designed to heel strike with walking. So the maximum load that our heels can take without causing problems or breakdown or pain is the heel impact strike of walking. Now, with that said, you don't want to smash the ground every time you step. You're supposed to kind of walk softly. And that's one of the drills that we work on in our seminar is just walking quietly or walking softly, allowing your foot to interact with the ground and kind of absorb the impact as you kind of walk through, um, walk through your step. Um, and that's one thing that a lot of people notice when they start to go barefoot is they're way more conscious of how they're walking and they realize you know some of our therapists in the clinic everyone's barefoot in my clinic um all the therapists at least and the sport med docs are either wearing barefoot shoes or i think eventually we'll be able to bring them over to the dark side and get them barefoot but uh but one of the first things people start to notice is how hard they're hitting the ground and and being barefoot is actually one of the biggest things that brings it into their consciousness to start to walk more softly. And so you're just way more aware of how you're, how you're using your feet and how you're walking if you're not wearing um, shoes, especially cushion shoes or, or thick soled shoes. So I think it's, uh, I think we're supposed to heel strike with walking, although we're supposed to be aware of how we're in, interacting with the ground, which is much harder to do if you're wearing shoes. But running is definitely, a, in my opinion, 
it's a no, no to heel strike ever in running. So. Gotcha. Well, yeah. you know, I'm a yoga teacher, so I know there's a couple of fitness activities where you're asked to take your shoes off, which is, mm -hmm. which is a cool thing. But I do notice that I've never taken any class from any fitness instructor where they have you do anything with your feet. And I mm -hmm. stumbled upon the YouTube video I told you about where this yoga teacher got a basic like dollar, uh, you know, toe threading for, you know, so you can put your, nice. uh, what is it? Like a yeah, pedicure. Yeah, they basically yeah. give yourself a pedicure. And she was doing these these movements with the feet, which I was really fascinated with because the toes were like, like spread like this. So I tried mm -hmm. it out myself and I could definitely feel that there were some muscles in between the toes within the feet. They're going to activate it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, a lot of people, their feet are this foreign body part to them, right? They've never, they've kind of lost that connection so, so deeply that it's actually, their feet feel like this foreign body part that we have no control or no familiarity with in terms of articulating, you know, I've seen videos of people being able to essentially move toes individually and kind of like this. I tried the same thing. I can hardly do it with my fingers sometimes. Um, but we should be able to spread our, splay our toes. We should be able to independently articulate our toes, you know, lift the big toe up while all the, all the other ones are on the ground, lift all the other ones while the big toes on the ground. Like we should be able to do all these things. And, you know, the foot really isn't, that different in terms of its function and, and uh, innervation from our hands, right? Like we used to be quadruped, so they're, they, they've they evolved differently because we're bipedal now and we walk on our feet, which is why we did, we developed this arch, this arch stability in our feet to support our bodies. Um, but there's tons of sensory nerves and they're, you know, your feet are, are your, your primary, their primary job is as a sensor for the environment. So if you compare the feet to, you know, analogy I like to give to people in our seminars is if you compare your feet to your eyes, um, the sun, if, you, if you're exposed to the sun enough, it can harm your eyes. So we put sunglasses on to protect our eyes from the sun, but still allow us to see. We don't blindfold ourselves. Um, and that's what we're doing with our feet, right? Instead of wearing sunglasses, which is you in feet is the equivalent of barefoot shoes, which protect the foot, but still allow the foot to function properly and sense the ground. Uh, we're kind of wearing blindfolds. We wear these really thick, beefy shoes that um, es essentially negate the ability of the foot to sense the ground. And I think that plays into a lot of tightness upstream because the brain just doesn't know what's going on underneath you. And if it doesn't know what's going on, that's a threat. And so it instantly um, tightens a lot of tissues and areas just to protect you, right? It's trying to stop you from falling over. Or, and if it doesn't know what's going on, um, it's kind of in this constant emergency mode. So not to mention the fact that most people walk around on ramps all day, right? Like if you have a heel that's thicker than the forefoot, you're, you're essentially pitching your body forward and forcing yourself to posturally adjust upstream and all these other joints, um, which feeds into a lot of problems that we see, you know, quad dominance causing knee pain, um, tension in the low back and the, and the anterior hip, which causes, you know, back pain, hip problems, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I'm not saying shoes are the only culprit. I think sitting is probably a bigger one, but shoes play a massive role. So... So you, you mentioned in the in the emails that you you talk about the be the benefit of daily balance work. Like what what does that entail for people to make the transition out of the clunky shoes to a barefoot life? Yeah. So. Uh the hip stability work or, you know, when I came out of physio school, I didn't think anything of balance. I was like, ah, what's the big deal with balance? It's kind of silly. It's boring, whatever. Um, but then when I started looking at it, I, I kind of realized I inherently liked balancing on stuff. I don't know what it was. Every time we went on a trip, I would, if there was a railing, I would jump on the railing and just walk on it. It like put me in this instant state of flow. And I just, I don't know, I liked the challenge. And I quickly realized that, you know, because I like that, I basically just tried to source some parts. Um, this kind of, I went through a bunch of different kinds of tubing to find one that was rigid enough, but I made a balance beam for the clinic. And what I saw is that it's a perfect hip screen because if someone has a tight hip and can't stabilize their hip, they can't walk back and forth on a balance beam. They literally just can't. They have no ability to use the right stabilizers to stop themselves from falling over. And when they started to work on their hip, open up the front of the hip, uh, and then spend time working on this balance beam, their balance got significantly better. And so did the stability of their foot because the two are kind of interlinked like this. Um, and I just saw it as like a really powerful tool to, um, number one, screen hips. Number two, correct the hip stability deficits that happens with people that sit for prolonged periods of time, which, by the way, includes kids because they have desk jobs all day. Um, the amount of kids I treat in this in my clinic is insane. And kids shouldn't be getting messed up at, you know, in their teens. It's just, it's kind of, 
sad to see the fact that they're forced to sit all day and then they're getting screwed up because of that at such a young age. But, um, and it's fun. And that, I think that has to be, you know, an element of play or an element of people wanting to do it. It's hilarious. I get some patients in that, you know, towards the end of the session, I'll tell them to do 10 minutes on the beam and I literally have to kick them out of the clinic because they don't want to stop doing it. And I think that's very powerful, right? When you have this, um, you know, when you have this very, very simple yet elegant tool and instructions that are so simple that people can't mess it up, don't look down on your feet and don't fall off this thing. Um, and the beam coaches them better than I can. Every one millisecond, they get a coaching cue from the beam and it's, goes up to the, it goes through their foot, to their brain, to their hip, and that happens hundreds of times per second. I can't coach like that. So it just makes my job easier as a therapist. And, um, and I love to see, you know, people be able to see a tangible improvement from, from session to session or, or, you know, I always tell people the only reason I make these beams, cause I want to make the best balance beam possible. The most beefy, robust, um, durable balance beam I could, which is why they're, you know, significantly expensive, but I wanted to make them so that if a fitness facility wanted a balance beam and it was getting used 20 hours a day, every day, or someone threw it across a parking lot, it, nothing would happen to it. And so I often, I, I always tell people like, make your own balance beam, go buy a two by four, start on that. Um, go buy a piece of PVC pipe, start on that. Um, you know, with every balance beam that people buy from us, we give them an exercise system. So it's, you know, five different levels of exercises. One is the easiest, five is the hardest, and there's ex different exercises at each level. So it, it helps someone, you know, at the end of the day, it's just a piece of metal. But if you understand how to use it and how to progress yourself from, um, you know, poor hip stability and very beginner to, you know, very advanced hip stability, it's, you know, a byproduct of all this stuff was people's ankle mobility got better just by working on a balance beam. Their ankle mobility improved, their hip mobility improved, their hip stability obviously improved. So it just does so many good things when used consistently that I think it's a big reason that um, that we really uh, you know, harp on it and, and promote it a lot. And, you know, I'm in the next couple of weeks, I'm doing a couple, um, interesting sessions with some, uh, some high level athletes to show them how to use this balance beam as part of their training and to correct their feet and to correct their hips, because it really is quite a powerful tool. So. Dang. I mean, it sounds like gymnastics, but for, uh, yeah, kind of teens and, and adults. So you said you could literally go to a home improvement store and get a PVC pipe or a two by four plank and you can just start. Yeah. Just start, so two by four, I mean, that's usually people that grow that pretty quick, but for a lot of people, especially older people, um, a two by four of wood put on the ground, walking heel to toe, so straight line, heel to toe without looking down at the ground, which is very important because it forces your feet to talk to your brain instead of your eyes, um, walking back and forth for five minutes. When that's too easy, uh, you rip an inch off of it. So you, instead of a two by four, you go to a two by three, and then a two by two. And then maybe you put a yoga mat on top of the two by two to make it more challenging because it's an uneven, squishy surface. And then maybe you close your eyes to make it more challenging, right? Like there's many different levels. Uh, the ones that we use are an inch and a half diameter um, aluminum pipe, uh, which is quite narrow and the, the roundedness makes it very challenging. But I think it's nice to give people something extremely challenging that they can grow into instead of them having to get a new tool every single time. Uh, although for the average person, a two by four is a very powerful training tool and is available at any hardware store. So. Well, that'd be dope for uh, if I go get one and then experiment with, you know, getting people to practice yoga poses on it, mm -hmm. you know, like because sure. the whole concept of uh, just just because I'm in that world, the industry, mm -hmm. it's just like it involves people just standing and facing one direction all the time. And like that starts to become autopilot. So mm -hmm. there's, that's such a great way to add something into it, to change it, make it dynamic and like really engage. Definitely. Yeah. Well, on the on the kind of grand plan kind of schedule for TFC at the second half of 2019, uh, we want to launch TFC Yoga, which is going to be like a basically a yoga system that specifically caters to restoring feet and restoring hip stability. And it'd be a combination of, um, you know, body weight stuff and also using beams, right? Like we're we're actually about to come out with a new design for the beam, which is much more affordable. It can't be. You know, the beams that we currently have, they can be elevated or angled because of the end couplings. You can put legs on it, but this new one just has a cradle and it makes it much more available as like a personal tool that's more affordable. But, you know, I want to create a yoga system where people can have all the benefits of yoga, but also have it basically a, a tailored session um, to restoring your feet and restoring your hips through 
modifying different poses um, and going through certain flows that are geared towards, you know, beginner, intermediate, or advanced, um, and create kind of a system like that. Because I really think the yoga community is has been immensely powerful to get people aware of movement and aware of their bodies. And if we can add our own spin on um, traditional yoga and add in beam work or add in hip and foot specific reintegration stuff, um, I think that can be extremely powerful. So. Oh, that's pretty cool. The foot collective mm -hmm. yoga. Foot yoga. <laughs> yeah. Uh, much better than beer yoga and yeah. goat yoga. <laughs> hey, if it's your thing, it's your thing, right? <laughs> uh, what other plans do you guys have with the, the foot collective? Like, is it is it really, is it just you? Like, do you have a team of people for the foot collective? I know you have a team at the, the physiotherapy office, but... Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, so it's a very lean team. Uh, I'm kind of the primary person doing all this stuff right now. Um, but uh, I have another therapist that who I started the physio clinic with, uh, Mike. He's he's kind of the right hand man when it comes to the education side. So in terms of seminars, um, uh, I'm the only one that does the content at the full collective Instagram profile and and. Uh, you know, but he's he's going to play a bigger and bigger role with the seminar and the education side as things grow. And uh, my time has to be kind of you know, spent on the other side. So I also just, I have a guy called Steve. He's the guy that's directing the product side with TFC. So the footwear sales, um, and that, that I think has a huge amount of potential, right? Like right now we're sending stuff all over the world, but, um, our plan with that is to offer facilities or clinics, um, the ability to open up their own, uh, micro store. So basically, you know, they get a crate sent to them, in the crate is a display um, and a certain amount of inventory and a bunch of our TFC products. And it literally comes in a wood crate and you set it all up and it's your own mini TFC store. And uh, it allows them to, to make all the profits on the, you know, or most of the profits on what they sell. Um, and it allows us to kind of get things out there and uh, improve the availability of these, these, these specific kinds of footwear. Um, and as time passes, we're going to add more brands. And, you know, the idea with the shoes is I, t I literally personally test out um, every type of footwear that we uh, get in to make sure that it fits in line with um, healthy shoes. And so you'll never ever find a shoe uh, on tfcshop.com that doesn't abide by the principles of being uh, having a wide toe box, no heel lift, so it's flat, uh, no cushioning, no arch support. All of the shoes that we sell fit that profile and that's how we want to keep it forever. And eventually, you know, really down the pipeline, we want to be able to um, have our own footwear design facility where we can, um, you know, the the economics of footwear um, is pretty staggering in terms of how much money is made by these companies. And I think, you know, I, I think it'd be nice to have an everyday shoe that anyone can buy for $50 that's well built um, and is kind of like a glove for your foot. And I think that's something that, you know, the material science and the materials are available right now. They're just not being applied or uh, developed into footwear. Um, you know, even the way the shoes are sized, it's like, why don't you just build in materials that have some stretch involved so that you don't have to get a half size for every different foot type? Or if you have a wider foot, the piece of footwear just expands to fit your foot. Or if you're a kid, instead of having growing out of a size every month, you have one that lasts you through three, you know, traditional sizes and it just expands as your foot grows. So I think there's, there's insane amounts of potential in terms of footwear and um, getting good shoes to people for less, uh, for less money you know, having less of a margin on the shoes by just eliminating middlemen. And I think that's where, you know, even the name, the Foot Collective was really came about because I wanted to be a collective effort. I want this to eventually be a publicly owned company that's 100% transparent um, and that anyone, you know, if, if someone lives in India or China or Australia, they can buy a share in the company for $1. Um, and I think digital currencies have to kind of catch up to a point where that's feasible. But and then have the company be 100% transparent, right? All the financial statements get shown to everyone. Where does every dollar get spent? Here it is. It's plain sight. There's no one getting paid massive salaries or big bonuses or all that bullshit. Um, basically, just redefining what a corporation is to a company that works for the people. Um, and, and the people that use the company or purchase products from the company are the beneficiaries of, you know, if any any profits get made, it gets distributed to everyone that's a co-owner of the of the company. And there might be millions of people from around the world that co-own a piece of this company. Um, but I think that's, you know, that's thinking far into the future. But uh, I, I think in order to know where you're going, you got to know what the end goal is. And that might change. But that's what I envision for, you know, everyone wears shoes and everyone has fucked up feet. And if we can create a company that caters to helping everyone more than just lining the pockets of wealthy investors, that's what needs to get done. And I think that's what 
TFC has the potential to be. Um, and, you know, there'll be a bit of a, a bit of a trek to get there, but I think we have, you know, I'm, I'm now I'm trying to recruit, you know, some people of the similar mindset that are, you know, way smarter than me and, and can help me kind of grow this thing to the point where we can reach more and more people and, uh, and make sure we keep those core values in place um, and never lose touch with that. I, you know, I, I literally see like the analogy of like, you know, it's all about the feet, right? So it's from the toe, the toe up, like from the mm -hmm. ground up versus, yeah. you know, top down, you know, corporate. There you um, go. Yeah. Yeah. But that, yeah. I mean, that's pretty dope to have that vision because that anchors you, you know, it drives mm -hmm. your every waking moment of what your purpose is. And mm -hmm. I think, I think it's amazing. And you are definitely making a huge impact. You know, it's, it's a huge, huge shoe to fill. No, no shoe. <laughs> I mean, puppy shoe. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's. I don't know. I just have to find, just have to find people to to kind of, you know, help me get there. But I, you're right. I think it's important to have a sense of, um, sense of purpose, and I think that's what, you know, some days, um, some days are easier than others, and uh, and knowing that you're doing something that's trying to go in the right direction and trying to spread the truth about. Uh, health and you know I, I really want TFC to be a health content company um, as its primary product uh, forever so eventually expanding on the um, YouTube content or creating you know a platform online where anyone can access all the content which you know the products are only being sold to fund the content that's kind of really the motive um, you know allow us to hire more physical therapists allow us to you know eventually I want there to be a therapy division with the Foot Collective where it doesn't matter where you live, um, if you want to speak to a TSC therapist, you can go on Skype and connect, you know, think of it like the Uber of physical therapy. So if you are somewhere and you want to be, you want to talk to someone about your feet, TFC will kind of facilitate you being connected with someone else through Skype that you can talk to for 30 minutes or an hour or whatever, however long you want to talk to them um, and learn about, you know, where do I go next? These are my issues. Where do I go next? And there are limitations to to doing a consultation online without being in person, but they're actually not that big of a limitation because of how basic the fundamental information that people need is, is, you know, it's very basic advice. And I think, um, I think that's possible now through things like Skype or things like digital currency, where there's not these big impediments in place to reach someone on the other side of the world and be able to, um, you know, engage in commerce, right? You want something from me, uh, I need to be compensated for what I'm giving you. And until now, that's been very hard to do uh, across international borders, whether it's because of, you know, Skype got rid of the obstacle of being able to reach that person. Uh, but we still have the obstacle, you know, I deal a lot with international manufacturers. And if I buy something from someone in the States or Europe, um, <laughs> there's a big, there's a lot of middlemen taking a little piece of the, of, of the, of the money. Um, and so it just creates an inefficiency, but I think digital currency is going to solve a lot of that once, as it matures and becomes more accepted and all that kind of stuff. So I'm pretty excited to see where, uh, where things go and what technology allows us to do in terms of, uh, you know, reaching that goal that we, that we have. You know, to, to backtrack a little bit, you, you talked about being able to expand and take on physical therapists and be able to connect that uh, eventually you have a team of TFC specialists. Um, this question is about how someone like me or someone interested in becoming a physical therapist, but they want to go to a program where they also know how to address the feet, basically the whole body, um, because mm -hmm. earlier you did mention that you, di you didn't learn much about um, the feet or the information that you got wasn't relevant to today's uh, lifestyle or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the curriculum is a very behind school. and. You know, I have friends in medical school and they're the exact same way. They learn about a million and one drugs, but they don't learn about sleep, which I would argue is one of the biggest problems we have today is lack of sleep and all the problems associated with that or diet or movement. Like it's really, you know, we do through my clinic, we, um, we have another company called Optimize Academy and we give the courses to new graduate physical therapists. a one day course on movement and mobility and how you integrate that into treating people because school teaches you a lot about uh, how to treat symptoms or um, how to diagnose a pathology, but they're terrible at teaching you how to actually treat other humans and, and educating them on what they need to do to care, take care of their own bodies. And it's very, um, it's 
to be honest, it's very sad and, and almost embarrassing to see how poor these schools, they're so old and antique and they're not, they're, they're 50 years, they're teaching what they taught 50 years ago, which is nonsense in a day where you can learn anything from anywhere in the world by going on a website called YouTube. Um, you know, they need to be teaching us how to filter through the good information and the bad information. And they need to empower people to understand, you know, every physical therapist or, and it's not even physical therapists, you know, I think the TFC team in future, um, you know, most people become physical therapists so that they can put the little letters beside their name and charge insurance companies for treating people. But at the end of the day, anyone can help anyone with this stuff as long as they want to learn about it. And, you know, eventually I want to, you know, even creating something like, and this is kind of on the roster. I'm not sure when it'll end up happening, but TFC University creating an online university platform quote unquote university, um, where people can go and learn and get a certification to then be able to, you know, meet a certain criteria of understanding how the body works and how the feet integrate and foot health and, and health in general. Um, and then be able to be on the, on the, on the team of people that are able to help other people. So I think it doesn't need to be, we're not necessarily going to be looking for physical therapists only. I think, you know, movement coaches, personal trainers, anyone that has, a desire to learn about this stuff and help other people and be part of this kind of mission moving forward. Um, we want it to be open to everyone because at the end of the day, you know, yoga instructors, personal trainers, um, people that are interested in sleep and diet, you know, these people might not have professional designations of doctor or physical therapist or whatever. Um, but it doesn't matter, you know? So we really have to, I think we have to get away from that because honestly, I know a lot of personal trainers that are significantly more effective than 95% of the physical therapists in Ottawa. And that's, a, it sucks to say that, but it's the reality. So. Yeah. I mean, just looking into what it requires, what going into physical therapy requires and, you know, all the pre, all the prep work you have to do and all the hours you have to put in like shadowing other people and doing all that stuff. And, you know, it's just, mm -hmm. it's just where I'm at right now, like trying to explore how can, how can I as a movement um, instructor be able to deepen my understanding and be able to make a much more positive impact that's relevant mm -hmm. to what's going on right now. You well, know? you're doing it right now. You're doing it through these podcasts, right? Like these are, these are insanely influential and important um, platforms for media for people to be able to get this information, right? Like I, I said that I did another podcast this morning uh, and I told the guy like, this is important. What you're doing right now, the fact that you're taking the time and reaching out to people and talking to people and having these conversations, uh, this is immensely important. And I, I think you're probably reaching and touching way more people than you might even think. Um, but yeah, I mean, if it ever, if, you know, when the point comes where you want to work with people in person, I think uh, thinking outside the box, instead of thinking traditional uh, pathways of education, thinking, you know, trim all the fat and say, how do I help people? Because it honestly, spending six years or, or whatever in, in school, learning how to wave a little magic wand, people call ultrasound on people's shoulder to help with their shoulder pain. That's not the way to do it. Um, so I think you just got to want to learn. You got to be open minded to the fact that um, you'll never know anything, but you can get much closer to knowing a lot about something specific. And if that's health or sleep or diet, whatever it is, you know, Pick a topic that you're interested in that helping people, you know, understand these things wouldn't feel like work and just pursue it. And, and you know, don't be afraid of, of any obstacles that are in your way. I think too many times, I think this generation now is, is much more open to that. But, you know, I, lo I know a lot of people are like, well, I, my job sucks. Uh, I wish I could do something else, but I can't. It's like, well, actually you can. You just have to, you just have to be persistent and, and not fear um, failing because failure is is how you learn, right? I fail every day. I just don't allow that to stop me from doing what I want to do or, 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 you know, you just keep persevering. I just send Vivo Barefoot like tons and tons of emails just to get them to even want to sell, to allow me to purchase their product. And, and now it's a really awesome partnership. They're a great company, but you know, just, just be fearless. I, I guess I would say to people, be really realistic um, and rational, but be fearless because it's really, you know, you look at a lot of the big people that are very successful. I know Elon Musk failed a lot. Jack Ma failed a lot. These guys, these guys that failed the most are actually the guys that are doing the most right now just because they didn't let that stop them. So, sorry, I got off on a bit of a tangent there. <laughs> oh, that is that is a perfect ending to, to this conversation because there's yeah. got to be so many people out there that, 
you know, whether they're already movement instructors or they're sitting at a desk at a cubicle trying to figure out how they can make a positive impact. And, mm-hmm. you know, just what I'm getting from what this whole conversation is, like, you, you saw a need and you just, you're just going for it. So, and mm-hmm. it's helping the masses. So, um, thank you so much. Thank you for taking you're the welcome. time out of that. This no, sounds like worries. a Thanks for having schedule, me. but... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, just looking forward to to see the evolution of uh, TFT. Cool. Well, thanks again for having me. And uh, yeah, let me know. Give me the coordinates of this thing when it airs, and I'll put it on our um, our main education page and fire off something on Instagram. And we'll see how many uh, how many people can you know hear this information because, like I said, it is it's important stuff. And the key to health is information is understanding how your machine works, and and these things are important to guide people about how they can get that information.